Um, so thanks so much for joining me today, Paul. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to speak to you. I've been loving your book, Happy Ever After. Um, there's so many interesting tidbits and so much research that's gone into this that just really makes you think differently about things that I think we just assume are going to make us happy. Um, can, you, can you tell us, just to begin with, what it is that you do and how you got to where you are today? Uh, yes, so I'm a professor uh, at the LSE, uh, Professor Happy, as I'm called in the press, which I'm not sure that's uh, entirely what I'd like to be known as, but um, I do research into behavioural science and into happiness and, 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 and into ways in which individuals and policymakers in particular can change environments and context in ways that make it easier for people to be happy. Um, and so uh, my first book, Happiness by Design, did very well. And uh, that was a really about how you can design your environments in ways to make it easier to be happy. And the second book is to alert people to some of the, I guess, the barriers and obstacles and challenges that might get in the way of them doing that. Brilliant, brilliant. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about what Happy Ever After is about? Yes, I am very happy to do that. Uh, it, the subtitle is um, Escaping the Myth of the Perfect Life. And that's actually a very good that's a very good summary of the book um, there are lots of social narratives around how we ought to behave the things that we ought to accomplish and achieve in our lives uh, and the ways in which we judge other people insofar as they do or do not achieve those things so for example we should be rich and successful and clever get married and have kids um, and you know some of these things are good for some people some of the time but certainly not for all of us all of the time and I want to draw attention to the fact that you might be someone who is doing things because your parents expect it of you because society expects it of you maybe there's evolutionary advantage in it but they might not be the things that are going to bring you happiness day to day and might not be consistent with your authentic or true self insofar as one exists and so the sort of acceptance phase I suppose of the behavior change first if you if you have any therapy of any kind really the first the first step is to accept who you are and this is about accepting maybe that some of what you might do might be driven by stories and not by what's going to make you happy that's so fascinating and and how many of us unfortunately just believe the the myths in society that we need certain things or we need life to be perfect in order to be happy i think especially for people listening this idea of the perfect life will really resonate because we're so much sold this idea that you can have it all and that you know it's totally achievable to have thousands of instagram followers and be rich and live this kind of lavish lifestyle but um we're kind of comparing ourselves with something that isn't necessarily attainable and i would say looking at kind of research into what people worry about the most money comes up very highly in yeah. terms of that um, and yeah. from your sort of research and, and what you write about in the book does money make us happy so you, I think you drew attention to it then in the question. It's it's whether money's drawing attention to itself. And so, if you're worrying about how you can pay the bills, you know, feed and clothe the kids or whatever, that's going to make you miserable. It's going to be very attention seeking in a negative way. And so, getting out of poverty is going to make you happy. Um, and so, that's a very important um, challenge, both for individuals and policymakers, is to alleviate poverty. But once you get to, you know, sort of average levels of income and you're not paying attention to those things to quite the same extent, you don't need very much more money. And so if you're then driven in an addictive way almost to accumulate more assets and wealth and consume more stuff, then you just get on this treadmill where you can never have enough. And then you start paying attention to money in a different way. Like, have I got the right kinds of investments? Do I have the right kinds of stocks? And and then money starts becoming attention-seeking, um, again, in negative ways at, at, at higher income. So one of the things that actually surprised me in some of the data is when you look at people's experiences of happiness on a daily basis they not only don't continue to increase with income they can actually fall uh, it appears as if there might be and this is not causal with like good randomized controlled trials but the correlational data so far as they tell us anything suggests that people at the very highest incomes are less happy than those that are, that are in mid incomes and that's interesting and surprising i think um, and why do you think that is well, partly because they do pay attention to money in different ways, and also they use their time differently, right? So if you're if you're constantly chasing more money, you're going to have to work longer hours. You may have to commute further to work, and it, all the while you're giving up time that you could be doing things that would make you happy in the moment, like being with people that you enjoy being with, and so on. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think in the book you show 
charts about how much money is kind of the optimal is it about fifty thousand dollars yeah it, is, I mean, it does very it does right yeah about fifty thousand pounds it, it, it does it does uh it does vary um and and again it's correlational so i don't want to read too much into that but there does appear to be a sweet spot um and that sweet spot probably comes a lot sooner than most people would imagine um and you know i very much like i i, I enjoy it talk so i often ask people I did it. I did it um, last night at a talk. Actually, I asked everybody in the audience at a, a gig I did in London um, whether they thought they were rich, and you know, I don't know. You know, one to five percent of people put their hands up. This is in an auditorium in central London, where people have paid to come and hear me talk, and only one to five percent of the audience think they're rich. If you put those people in the income distribution on Earth, they are in the top. God, God knows, 0.0001 percent or something. Even in the income distribution in the UK, they're probably all in the top one or five percent, ten, ten percent. So by any definition, they're rich. But because we're constantly looking upwards, they don't think of themselves as rich because they don't have a yacht, right? Um, but you know, that's that's and that's that's part of our challenge is that those comparisons are nearly always upwards, never downwards. Reminding ourselves how well we're doing compared to many more other people, but how we're not quite as rich as rich as other people above us and so you can never unless you're going to be jeff bezos or bill gates and probably even then they're fighting with each other to who's going to be number one spot is you're never going to never going to be happy once you buy into that addiction cycle yeah so we need to recognize that more money is not going to lead to necessarily more happiness probably is it yes you know and that's not a new that that is i think there's other things in the book that are newer and fresher um but that's you know i think a sort of confirmation of that narrative being one that's uh that can be potentially harmful. It's a bit like, you know, just once you get sucked in, once you get once you get sucked in, it's really, really hard to then get out um, to any addiction, right? I'm only going to, mm. I'm only going to use drugs a little bit or something, you know, and then, um, you know, some people can, but other people will get hooked. And I think the same thing happens to success and status and money. One thing I thought that you mentioned that was really interesting was how harshly in society we judge people if they're not if, if they're satisfied with what they have because there's this attitude in society that we always have to be going for more we always have to be pushing harder trying to get more money and people are deemed lazy or unambitious if they're not kind of going for the promotion and going for the bigger job and yeah or even when you've even achieved what might by by what others might define as success you're still expected to do more i've, I've done um did both um bbc breakfast this week and um sunrise on sky news yesterday and both of the the female presenters said that they're always being asked what they're going to do next. Like as if that's as if as if everything is a stepping stone to something else. And they both said that they're very happy doing their current job. Why do people want them? Why do people expect them to be doing more? So even so, no matter where you are, you're expected. Even if you're, you know, you know arguably being a breakfast TV presenter is, a, you know, a good thing. It's a reasonably, you know, successful and status job. That you're still expected to do something beyond that. That's that's in itself isn't enough. You need to be thinking about what next. Um, and uh, you know there is a sense in which we could just enjoy the moment a bit more. It's kind of like when, once you've had one child, people are asking when the next one's coming, or you've written one book <laughs> and they're asking when the next book's coming. Well, I know that's what happened. I know, I know. Well, I hope my editor doesn't keep asking when my third one's coming. <laughs> I don't know. It's enough hard work doing the second one. Yeah. Um, it says on the back of this book that your books make people quit their jobs. How do you feel about that? Are you proud of that? <laughs> Oh, I'm incredibly proud. I have no, I, you know, I talk. It, it, it's part of the part of the catalyst for the second book was was what I wrote about in Happiness by Design, where, uh, and it's the only time I think I talk about jobs. Actually, is when I talk about a friend who was working at Media Land. You can kind of guess where where that is, and she, um, we went for dinner. and She complained about every aspect of her job, every, like every bit of it. Her commute, her colleagues, her boss was making her miserable. And then at the end of dinner, when we stood up and we were leaving, she sort of reflected for a moment and she said, "You know, I love working at Media Land." And that's also consistent in the sense that when she thought about whether it should make her happy, it did. She it was, it was somewhere she'd always wanted to work. Her parents were proud. Her friends were jealous. How could she not be happy working there? Uh, and that sort of makes you know, a very interesting distinction between evaluations and stories on the one hand and experiences on the other. And sometimes they cohere, but oftentimes they don't. And we're kind of living in these narratives about things that we think we ought to be doing the successful job and the one that you always wanted and the, and the ones that your parents like and friends are jealous of as, as compared to actually what's going to make you happy day to day. So if it, if it, if it acts as a nudge to get people to quit jobs to only show up as being happy when they think about whether it ought to, then I think that's a good thing. 
So do, do you think it's that people don't question um, the idea that just because it's kind of a glamorous job and maybe it's not making them happy, they don't question that because they're so distracted by the glamour of what they're doing or the status of it? Or are we in denial? Yeah, I think there's lots. Of, I mean, I think it will vary um, across people. I mean, you know, some people do do um, enjoy those jobs, of course. Um, but I think, you know, you can. A lot of people will get. I, I, have, a, I have a lot of LSE where, where where students will come to me and say they're going to take a very you know lucrative consultancy job, but they're only going to do it for a couple of years. Um, and I say you're not. <laughs> you're going to do it for twenty years. Um, because it's a bit like that sort of, I'm only going to take drugs once or twice. You know, you kind of, once you get sucked in and you get more money and you get promotion and the next promotion's coming and you and you might then start getting financial commitments like a mortgage and stuff, it's very hard to walk away from it. So I think it's it becomes a, a, an investment, not a sunk cost. You just kind of just, you know, keep going because you're on the treadmill and it's very hard to get off. Um, and, you, and you may tell yourself at some point, you know, you're going to then enjoy the happiness of the fruits of your labor later. Uh, but that's a lot of happiness postponed. And even insofar as you will even do that at some point later anyway. So I think there's all sorts of reasons why people make those mistakes. Um, but it's just hard. I mean, we, you know, we, there's no doubt that we we benefit from status, um, evolution advantage, mating uh, advantage. Um, the question then is you know, what dimensions and attributes we define status according to. And we nearly and we nearly, you know, always do it um, according to occupation. And, and not according to other dimensions like pro-social behaviors or kindness or um, you know things that we could that we could celebrate if only we were to think about organizing society differently so I think in this book more than the first I, I do touch on some of those those policy aspects much more because it's very hard for any one of us to swim against the tide even if sometimes we recognize that doing so might make us happier so what policies would you introduce well, I think like if you st if you search on if you search on Google for the for the world's richest, it's it's, it's a man at the moment. It'll probably be a man for a bit longer before women start earning as, as much. It's Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates. The answer comes up very quickly. Um, uh, you you type in the 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 world's highest taxpayer, and you find lots of tax avoidance and tax evasion schemes. You find um, uh, countries where they have the highest tax rates. There's no celebration of people who contribute towards society in the same way as those that accumulate assets. Um, there's no reason in principle why we couldn't celebrate those those uh, contributions more than the consumption. Okay, so we need to, to celebrate um, people that are contributing that maybe don't get the success status that um, they deserve and sort of change that around. Yeah, and actually, you know, there are... Um, there are some advantages to that as well. I mean, men that are seen as being generous. So in one study, they looked at they looked at uh, attractiveness and generosity, and um, the most desirable men were the attractive and the generous ones. So generosity added almost as much as attract as physical uh, physical attractiveness did. But it's very interesting that we maybe in some of our social media posts and stuff, we're not really posting our good deeds. We're posting our, you know, uh, consumption. I suppose if someone did post a good deed, would they get flat for it, do you think? Someone posts that they've it's given some money to charity. I know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a really interesting thing. I know we all have this, kind of, have this aversion to people who kind of virtue signal in oh, some yeah. sense. But, you know, because it is isn't you know, done in a way of sort of virtue signaling. But, and maybe, but maybe part of the reason we don't like it is that we feel a little bit guilty about it not being us. Um, and, and maybe that, you know, that, that, that potentially that guilt could motivate action. Um, you know, if you, if, if everyone's competing on, you know, how much volunteering they've done, I better start volunteering because I'm going to be left behind. <laughs> so, uh, it's a, it is a, it is a tricky one, but, um, you know, it's just insofar as, insofar as we are going to compete with one another for status and, um, success, the, you know, the, 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 the reframing and refocusing of that towards, social good and away from pub private consumption can only be a good thing i think yeah so maybe we should start posting about the money we're giving to charity risking being disliked but for the greater good of guilting everyone into and guilt great good of guilt and actually you know you I, it would be very interesting it'd be very interesting to do a do a you know a study where you where where i don't know men for example posted their their car or their you know cleaning up uh, working at a um homeless shelter or something and, and and which 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 man the woman found most attractive sounds like a good, sounds a good study
<laughs> um, can we talk about marriage? Because I think this comes yes. up a lot um, amongst my clients, my friends. It's constantly a topic of conversation amongst kind of women in their thirties because of I think the yes. pressure, the pressure to be married, to find a partner, to have children, all these things that we are expected by society and probably encourage each other by kind of talking about it so much. But um, it seems like from the research that marriage isn't necessarily a route to happiness. No, I've said a lot in, in, in the press recently, which has been picked up on that, that you know, the health, the, the, one, of the, one of the healthiest and happiest population subgroups um, like the, with, the, with the longest life expectancy, uh, best physical health and high support to happiness are women that have never married and never had children. Um, and, you know, that's in spite of the fact that, ah, oh, bless them, you know, maybe one day they'll meet the right guy and that'll all change. They're actually doing really fine. <laughs> they don't need a man in their life in order to be happy. And they certainly don't need children. And um, it is interesting, isn't it, that, that you know, the, mar- the, the effects of marriage appear to be much stronger for men than for women. I mean, we're, basically, men men calm down when they get married. They stop acting like idiots. And so we take fewer risks. Uh, we live longer, we're, we're, we're healthier, we get promotions at work, um, we're kind of more sensible. Whereas women just have to put up with the idiot. Um, and so there's there's kind of actually, it's, it's a really question, you know, it's actually not a lot to be gained if you're a woman from getting married. From the happiness evidence, on average, of course, there's huge variation across different people. Uh, but it's interesting that the story around marriage is much more... Um, powerful and pernicious for women than it is for men right if you're a 40 year old man that's never married well that's fine you know it's kind of quite cool if you're a 40 year old woman there's something wrong with you um and that's quite in contrast to to what the evidence tells us and people judge and people judge single people differently as well right so if you if you present people with a vignette of of, of essentially the same person but then define them according to whether they're married single and trying to find somebody or single by choice and you and you and you ask essentially people to rate how happy they are, how good they are, what kind of decent person they are. The the least liked person and the, and those suspected to be the least happy are the single by choice. It's actually better to be a single person who's trying to find somebody in people's judgment than it is to be single by choice. There's something very suspicious. We don't like people who who choose to be different. We don't like choose. We we don't like people who choose not to go with the norm. And part of that, I think, is because, you know, we want them to fit in and we have all sorts of higher, we have, we have all sorts of ways in which we think society should be organised according to the lens through which we see it. But I think also what's really interesting is that sometimes that might be motivated out of a bit of jealousy. I'd actually quite like to be like that. And those bastards are doing it. And I can't because I'm constrained by society. It's a very interesting study that looked at um, um, men, classifying men into essentially whether they were homophobic or, or, or not, two groups of people, and then showing them, uh, you know, gay porn and looking at arousal through penile blood flow in, in the two groups and finding on average that the group that were homophobic were more aroused by the gay porn than those that weren't homophobic. And, you know, that's that's not surprising in one sense. It's because I'd, I'd actually quite like to be gay or I'm attracted to men, but I can't be because religion or society or my parents would you know you know kind of uh, uh, frown on that and that would be a bad thing for me to accept so so much better that i dislike what i could otherwise be um than it is to be than it than it than it, than it is to think about being like that so that's why some of these stories are so hard to overcome so we potentially resist the thing that we actually want but just the married people are just jealous basically just jealous potential well i mean jealousy <laughs> jealousy and insecurity motivates a lot of human behavior <laughs> Um, uh, and, and nearly always in bad ways. So I think that's going to be quite reassuring for all the single people listening that it, you know, don't don't listen to the pressure. You could be happier, better off, live a longer life if you're single. Fascinating. It's definitely going to be an interesting discussion with my boyfriend later about this. We've been together <laughs> nine years. We've had quite a few conversations about getting married, but now I'm thinking I'm going to be healthier maybe yeah, without. Sec- I know. Well, he's going to hate me after this. You know, I'm not <laughs> show him this, but you know, you want to say to him, "What's in it for me?" That's, yeah. that's me. like I kind of know what's in it for you, <laughs> but, but I want to know what's in it for me. Um, <laughs> uh, that's that's that's. Uh, yeah, God, he's gonna he's gonna hate me. Don't don't, don't, don't let him. I'll tell him where you work. Um, 
But the kids free, well, yeah, and I'm, I'm easily found. But the, 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 the kids thing is interesting as well, though, so because, you know, we kind of celebrate childbirth. People will, will send around pictures of their baby to colleagues at work as if, like, it's an amazing thing they've just done without any regard, really, for people who might have tried and not been able to have them, for those that choose to be childless. It's kind of like a celebration of your narcissism. Um, and 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 actually, of your really really selfish actions in relation to environmental damage, right? If you if you engage in about half a dozen behaviours that would be considered to be pretty substantive behaviour change in relation to environment, like driving half as many miles each year, for example, that would offset about five hundred tons of CO two. One fewer child is about ten thousand tons of CO two. So ironically, it's the it's the childless ones that are that are selfless, and they're 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 helping save the planet for 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 for, for those of us that are selfish and have children. So forget veganism. Choosing not to have children is the best thing to save the planet. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I sort of wouldn't forget veganism for those people that are vegans. But <laughs> the, um, certainly, again, because it kind of speaks to this point that I just I just keep making throughout, and it's not you know it shouldn't be a controversial point. Is that there's no one size fits all approach to living. Just like if you want to be a vegan, knock yourself out. I mean, I don't I don't care. I mean, I, I, actually, you know, there's probably quite a lot of social benefits that come from that. But you know, so far as you're not actively harming other people, just get on and live your life. I mean, I've never I've never I've never. Maybe I don't care enough about other people, but I certainly don't care enough about what other people do. I mean, you know, as long as they're not impacting me in negative ways, and I guess because I don't, I don't, I don't have any of, of those those obvious. I mean, I've obvious other insecurities and maybe even jealousies, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have any insecurities or you know, kind of jealousies around the lives that people lead. It's just I'm very happy for people to get on and live according to what works for them, and not to judge them harshly if they live a little differently to me. Yeah, sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. But that hasn't always been that hasn't always been the been the case though. Like because in I don't really care. Like it in in academia, I, I um you know there's an expectation that we act in a particular way, not just not just in work but out of work, right? So when I said in Happiness by Design that I don't read novels, my God, I mean it's like the most heinous crime I could ever have committed. Just don't read novels. I mean read loads of nonfiction, but everyone expects me to read novels because I'm a professor at the LSE, but I don't expect them to do bodybuilding, which they don't, of course, because you don't see any middle-class people at a bodybuilding competition. But I don't care what they do. They play croquet or tennis and read novels, whatever. I don't care. I mean, as long as they're good at their jobs. So it's really quite pervasive and pernicious, that judgment that we make on others. And, and do we make that judgment because we're maybe jealous or because of those societal norms and... Or is there other reasons? Why do we judge people like that so much? Yeah, so we, we talked a little bit about the jealousy thing um, and the insecurity thing. I think there's also a social dominance orientation. It's called SDO in the academic literature, social dominance orientation. And it's basically the degree to which you believe in structures and hierarchies and systems that organise society in a coherent way. And if you, so if, you, if, you're, if you're from a working class background, for example, and you become successful in middle class occupation, if you retain some of your working class values, beliefs and behaviours, that's a threat to the middle classes, right? Because if one working class person can get in and be themselves, then the floodgates will open and our position in society will be undermined. So what you have to do is you have to take on the characteristics of the middle class people in order to survive and be successful. And so, you know, I have academic colleagues, one of my friends here who works with me here, he's on the face, I mean, you just look at him and he's just a posh bloke. Um, but he came from Middlesbrough, had a very strong northern accent, went to university, got ridiculed by um, staff as well as students and and learned to change the way he spoke in order to fit in. And that's fine. He's done reasonably well out of it. But he, he kind of resents that a little bit, you know, having to change who he was in order to succeed. Um, and I just like people to kind of be, have the opportunity to be their authentic selves, whatever that means, you know, to we all have to make compromises and fit in. It's stupid to say that we could just be ourselves. But we shouldn't have to do it quite so much and we shouldn't have to do it according to the rules that are set for us. I think it's it's important that you're shining a light on a bias that we don't normally think about, potentially. Um... Well, I think so. I mean, we're very alert and quite rightly so to, um, uh, to kinds of discrimination based on gender and race and disability and age, but not, not on class. I mean, in fact, there's no legislation to stop people doing what the hell they like by class. Um, and it's it's just people don't even know they're doing it half the time. You know, you get comments about accents or about behaviours or about uh, 
you know, swearing or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is in my case sometimes. And it's like, that's just, they don't even, they don't even know that you could say, you can say things about class-based behaviors and attitudes that you cannot say about gender or race that you would be hold, hold up in front of the coals for doing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating and definitely something for us all to be aware of. Um, can we go back to the, the child thing? Because I think this is such a big yeah. issue, people, yeah. myself included. Um, is like, this is basically almost... a personal therapy session for you. Basically, this, is basically just... a way, this is basically a way of you telling your boyfriend that you're not going to marry him <laughs> and, and uh, you're not going to have kids with him. Can I just say on the on the marriage thing, if yeah. you if you are if you are stupid enough to get married, then um, then then don't spend a lot of money on your wedding. Um, there's very good data to show that the more you spend on your wedding, the more likely you are to divorce. That is fascinating. Yeah, I did make a note of that, actually. I did make a note of that. And it's not surprising. I mean, first of all, you people get into debt, so they start arguing about money. But but the other thing is that you're doing it as a, you know, like, why are you spending so much money on this wedding? You're doing it as a show of how much you love each other. Well, if you love each other, just get on and be quiet about it and keep it to yourselves, right? I mean, that's, you don't have to broadcast it in such a massively public and expensive way. And the stress of organising a wedding takes over a year of your life. I, I mean, You know, it's yeah. one of the most stressful things that people can go through, I think. Well, you're talking to someone who got married... Um, whose total cost of wedding was 103 pounds and 50 pence 60 pence um, 60 pounds of which was to prove who we were and and 43 pounds 50 was to hire brighton register office for five minutes and go in there and say i do so we're at the other people might want to spend a bit more than that but you don't have to go mad <laughs> okay good news yeah my, i think my parents yeah. spent about 300 pounds on their wedding and they're always <laughs> they're always saying this to me saying don't don't wait to you know save up the money to have a big wedding yeah. you just have a cheap wedding like we did it's fine and they've been married for 35 years or something so well, but, there you go so you want to ask about kids yeah i want to talk about this because i mean have, i mean obviously when your kids grow up they might read what you've written about um having children which i know <laughs> it's obviously <clears throat> it's obvious that you love your kids very much um, i mean only joking about that but you're almost are pointing out the the kind of negative sides of having children that often maybe parents don't say because it's yeah yeah so, so, wrote, so, I guess. So, so my kids are 10 and 9 now and they're they're absolutely lovely they're a lovely age and i think they're at the sweet spot of no longer being babies but not teenagers and so i'm kind of very acutely aware that we've probably got another couple of years before they <laughs> aren't any fun again but when i was writing happiness by design that was you know five years ago or whatever they were five years younger and they weren't they weren't i, I didn't enjoy them i didn't i didn't enjoy having kids they they they, they were you know I, I remember saying to one of my mates um when they were about five i was like, I just like when am i going to start enjoying this and uh i don't i don't you know it's not fun and he said listen boy if you enjoy the conversation of a five-year-old you're not fit to be a parent and that that kind of made me feel a little more comforted but some people do enjoy it. again it's no one size fits all approach some people love babies they love you know they love young children and they love all the you know the the, the kind of silly things they do but but we didn't um and and i don't and i don't see that it's a problem to say that in fact it's, it's a good thing to say that because it doesn't set up this false expectation that your kids need to be unbounded joy all the time and if they're not there's something wrong with you you're not a very good parent or you know and so no so, so no wonder people have all these problems with children because they just think god i should be enjoying this like everybody else who's posting fantastic pictures of their of their kids on social media um and you know it's it's fine not to enjoy stuff sometimes it's fine to be honest about those things and it doesn't mean that you love your children any less and it doesn't mean that at some point they are actually going to bring you pleasure which which which, which uh, ours do now so um you know i hope that when they when they read that they'll just uh, appreciate how honest i was in saying that um and can be honest with me about how they feel i think that's really important because one of the things that any parent knows how to bring their kids up really you kind of muddle through and you get lots of conflicting um, advice and evidence. But one thing that we'd like to try to do with ours is to allow them the opportunity to tell us when we're messing up. Yeah, absolutely. I think having those sorts of conversations with parents is not usually the most easy conversation to have, but it can be quite healing to have those conversations, probably for both both parties. Um, yeah. Okay, and, and one thing you mentioned in the book as well that I wanted to share was that 43% of charities are set up by people who are child free. So Yeah, I know they're very much more pro social. P people who have kids become very selfish. Um, you know, I you know, I go, you know, I, I work hard and long hours and, and whatever else and then I spend time with my kids and I don't I don't think about doing charity work. I've got I've, I've got time for it. 
you know, too busy, too busy dealing with my own narcissism and my genetic in, inheritance. Um, you know, whereas whereas if I were childless, that counterfactual would be I might have more time to, to, to do things that are pro-social and for other people. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount of selfishness in many different levels for having children of your own. Okay, so we don't celebrate so when people post around when people are posting those pictures of their kids um, to their colleagues. I don't ever, I don't ever recall an adopted baby being set you know picture sent around right when someone's adopted a child, which is a much more beneficial thing to do because that baby's been born. So those CO those CO twos are going to be um, a bit by the children. And you probably we don't know what the counterfactual is. You're probably improving that child's life compared to them you not adopting them. But yet it's seen as a sort of second best route, right? You adopt when you can't have children of your own. Yeah, I think there's a sentence actually in the book that you say, are you going to potentially change a child's life that is already in existence or are you going to have a child that doesn't exist already? And actually the, yeah. the best thing to do would be actually to change someone who already is born their life rather than creating a new being. So yeah. why aren't we adopting more? Definitely food for thought definitely um what does make us happy if you had to give people one piece of advice about what what does make make us happy oh, I'm glad you, so i thought you were going to do monogamy next so i'm glad you moved uh, away from yeah, that yeah. we could go into um, that <laughs> so uh what sorry what one thing makes people happy um if you were going to give people advice people listening one piece of advice for what could make them happy what would you yeah. what would you say yeah the one piece of advice is that there's no one piece of advice i mean that's that's again that starts falling into the self-help guru uh, land of, you know, do this and it's going to make you happy. There are some things, though, having said that, and I talk about more of these more in Happiness by Design than I'm doing Happy Ever After, that are universally good for us. I mean, listening to music that you that you enjoy, the music that you choose for yourself, that you play for yourself or with other people, makes you feel good. I mean, there's, there's the, the, the evidence on music therapy is compelling. I mean, it's like it lights, the, lights all parts of the brain up in ways that no other stimulus does. Do more of it. And it's a really obvious insight, you know, do more of the things that make you feel good, like no shit, brilliant. That's a really amazing insight. But but we don't because we because we're and this is where the second book comes in. We're distracted to some large degree by the things that we think should make us happy. And we sacrifice the time with and doing the things that make us uh, feel good in order to achieve those things that we think are going to make us happy when we get there that invariably don't even if we achieve them. I think often people put off those things that make them happy and think, oh, I'm going to work, you know, I'm just getting through this busy phase at work and then I'll start, you know, having, planning a holiday or, you know, starting that hobby. But we get yeah. so distracted by things like work that really consume us and we don't make the time for those things that really do matter. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that's right. I think, um, you know, working long hours, I mean, working long hours is good, is, is good for you if it's truly volitional, but, it becomes an arms race, you know. You're in the office at six, so I'm in at five thirty. Um, and people in, reinforce that, you know, the CEOs of companies who, um, who kind of, I don't know, you know, um, sort of use it as a badge of honour. You know, I'm, I'm on, I'm, I'm on email at quarter to four in the morning, and I, you know, whatever. It's like, Jesus, really, mate, calm down. So that's not something to boast about. Yeah. There's something called, I think it's called busy porn, where people are boasting about how busy they are, or <laughs> you ask someone how they are, and they they talk about how busy they are. But actually, I think that should come with a health warning, because burnout, levels of burnout are increasing, people are depressed, stressed, and if people you are know, boasting about that. It is, it is interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, again, I mean, it would be, you know, there's no, there's no sense in which I would ever disagree with gender equality, for example. Of course, it's a stupid, I mean, it's kind of wired in me to to want to treat people equally and fairly. But sometimes, you know, women might make very good choices in careers and jobs that are going to give them opportunities to have a better work-life balance, to spend time with people that they like being with, to listen to music a bit more. Um, in a way that the status-driven environments that are typically male-oriented might not. Um, and, you know, it's great. I mean, again, you know, women who want to become CEO or go into STEM subjects or whatever, great, brilliant. We should be, you know, encouraging that as much as is possible. But there is a point at which some people may decide and women may decide more so than men that actually that's not always for them and that um, it's a sensible life choice for them to um, to to trade off some of these things for other things that they value in their lives. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of things about flexible working and if, if women can work flexibly, then yeah. they can fit into the, the kind of structure much more easily and, and earn maybe the same amount as men if they're able to do that. Yeah, but but you're not going to do that if you're if you're on email at three forty five, right? I mean, the idea, you know, and you know, I I, I personally wouldn't want to be a CEO of one of these companies, right? I mean, I, it's just like, why would I want to be doing that? I just I really genuinely wouldn't want to be doing that. So if people decide not to to do that based upon characteristics that that might be observable, then and I'm quite happy for that for that difference to exist. But for it to be truly volitional, that's the really thing that you that there is some sense in which people are we we can be confident that people are choosing um, to do these things. And also, I think we'd be looking much more at the other end of the status spectrum, if you like, um, than we are at the moment. So, how do we how do we encourage men to go into being teaching assistants or nursery school teachers or primary school teachers? I think it's a really you know it's a big challenge. I think we could do with more men teaching in primary school. So, what can we do about that? as a way to um, bring around more gender equality in the opposite direction in other in other areas of uh, life so uh, or, or in other occupations because we tend to keep tend to keep looking upwards and again you know don't and don't let anybody misinterpret what i've said it's absolutely right that there should be much more equality at the top end we absolutely need you know more more female ceos and more women going into stem subjects but at the same time we ought to be paying attention to um, gender differences that exist across the spectrum. Yeah, because I suppose if if little boys in primary school see male teachers, then they're more likely maybe to grow up and to want to be primary school teachers and kind of. Yeah, and again, you know, celebrate like there's, you know, there are there are ways in which men and women are very, you know, that society constructs differences between them that don't exist. There are things potentially that also do exist as differences between men and women that we should be recognising and, you know, accepting. And 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 again, it's finding that it's finding our way through that. And I think we tend to, I, I guess, pendulums swing backwards and forwards, don't they? They kind of, you know, we go from sort of one end, one one end to the other and back again. And and maybe some sometime we'll find a nice equilibrium where we're accepting of the fact that there'll be differences, massive differences within genders, but also across genders too, potentially to some degree. Can you can you share with us what makes you happy? Um, I'm enjoying this conversation, by the way. That's uh, that's 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 one thing right now. Um, I used to say I, I, I said that um, working, working out, and going out were the things that kind of you know brought me pleasure, purpose, and a combination of pleasure and purpose. Right. So I find um, that my work brings me a lot of purpose. Going to the gym is a is a good balance of pleasure and purpose, and then going out and having fun is something that's pleasurable. So, because I, I think the ba- as I talk in the first book, happiness is a balance between pleasure and purpose, and things that we find fun on the one hand and fulfilling on the other, and we need to work out for us what that balance looks like. But again, people people become addicted. You can become too addicted to uh, meaning and worthwhileness and, and and purpose, and not have enough fun. And equally, you could be having a lot of fun at the expense of doing some things that feel like they're worthwhile. So I think it's for everybody. I thankfully stumbled on the gym, really. I mean, for me, that's something that is a really good, and for me, it's also mindfulness as well, right? So I don't, I'm, I couldn't even imagine going on a mindfulness training program or on a retreat and not talking for an hour, let alone like five days or something. Um, but, the, but the time I spend in the gym is a time away from my phone. Um, it's a time that is focused only on the activity of lifting the next set of weights. And it, dist- and it and it and it you know allows my mind to be in the moment. Um, so it has it has the physical benefits that, that come from it to some large extent, but it's the mental health benefits that are equally as important, probably more so. And so finding something that you enjoy doing that is kind of like a mindfulness for you, um, I think, is an important source of happiness. And it, it could be gardening, it could be walking the dog, um, it could be you know whatever, but something that you kind of lose yourself in that feels like it's good even if it's not just hedonically pleasurable. Yeah, I think there is something really meditative about slowly li- lifting weights and the fact that you do have to be completely focused on it and it's quite a slow and controlled movement. <clears throat> and yeah, definitely good for people with anxiety to feel yourself getting stronger and to feel yourself making progress and feeling more grounded. I think weightlifting is incredible for that. So. Cool, good. Yeah. So. Thank you so much um, for speaking to me. Absolutely Thank fascinating. You. Where can people find out more about you? Are you on social media and what's your website? Well, I have, well, I have a Twitter account. I think it's uh, 
at, at Prof Paul Dolan, I think. So that's the Twitter. Um, then, of course, people should go and buy the book. You're going to keep plugging that. Happy Ever After, Escaping the Myth of the Perfect Life, out now in all good bookshops and on Amazon and wherever else you want to buy it. Um, and also Happiness by Design as well, for, for, for those that haven't seen the first book. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's it. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't know. That's, I, I, yeah, it's just I'm, I'm on uh, Twitter. It's, it's, Twitter is the only social media handle that we're using. Yeah, perfect. And I'll put all the links in the show notes for people to click right away. Thank Brilliant. you so much for that. I really enjoyed that conversation. Really fascinating. Thanks Sorry, so thank much. you very much. Just don't let your boyfriend hear any of it. Yeah, I won't. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks right. a lot. Thank you. Bye.